Further inland, nestled among a cirque of rolling hills, Tiradentes is a charming colonial town of Minas Gerais that is still not well known. Founded in 1702, Tiradentes became a base and an important stop on the Camino Real, the royal path for the convoys hauling gold and precious stones to Portugal. After years of neglect, it is now a charming town considered as one of the jewels of Minas Gerais. And to appreciate the village, there's nothing better than a carriage ride. Tiradentes is touristic, of course, but still authentic, with cobblestone streets, Baroque churches and chapels, rows of white and colorful houses that sparkle in the sunlight with their small paned windows, artisanal and antique shops, and numerous art galleries. Tiradentes was named after the father of Brazil's independence, condemned and executed in 1792 after a rebellious movement, the Inconfidencia Minera, that aimed to establish a republic. He was the only member of the movement who was executed. Hung, then quartered, his head was displayed on the central square of Rua Preto. His memory is honored here, with a statue made in his image. Off an alleyway, the church of Santo Antonio has preserved its charm of yesteryear, when the city profited from the exploitation of the mines in Minas Gerais. A masterpiece of Brazilian Baroque art, its facade was one of Alaradinho's last projects in 1810. Surrounded by mountains and tropical plants, this city has preserved a very special charm, distinctly off the beaten path. Further south, Parachi was founded in 1667 following the discovery of gold in the mountains of Minas Gerais. The city then quickly prospered as the port city from which ships departed carrying gold to Portugal. For two centuries, this small fishing port tucked away in a bay was the embarkation point of the Armadas, charged with transporting the natural resources of Brazil to Lisbon. Today, Parachi is an example of colonial Brazilian architecture, as well as an appreciated tourist stop three hours by road from Rio de Janeiro. It is a beautiful city built in the purest colonial style with white houses whose doors and windows are painted in lively colors and ornamental ironwork balconies. The paved roads are cleaned by the sea at high tide and people circulate on foot. Parachi was a secret city inhabited by soldiers, freebooters, and slaves, replaced today by vendors of artisanal crafts and casacha. Many Baroque and neoclassic churches are dispersed throughout the city. When it was decided in the 19th century that the gold road would pass through Rio de Janeiro rather than here, the city was nearly abandoned by its population. Until the 1950s, there was no road to access it. For this reason, the architecture has barely changed since this time. This gives the city major cultural and touristic appeal, especially since its restoration was very well done. During the summer season, many festivals take place in the city, and tens of thousands of tourists flood the souvenir shops and posadas, the Brazilian hostels. On a tourist level, Parachi benefits from another major advantage, the beauty of its surrounding natural environment. 
Parachi is nestled on a landscape of lush hills that plunge into the sea and resurface in the form of many small islets and beaches, a little paradise. Like Trindade, look at 25 kilometers away, white sand beaches, big rocks, and natural pools shaded by coconut trees. Costa Verde, or the Green Coast, is the name given to this site, worthy of an adventure film. St. Stephen's Cathedral in the first district is the symbol of Vienna and the largest Gothic building in Austria. Consecrated in 1147 in the presence of noble Germans ready to leave on the Second Crusade, it was destroyed shortly after in a fire and then later rebuilt. Some Romanesque portions of the old building were expanded on the west facade which is flanked by two towers that reach up to around 65 meters high. It has four towers, the highest of which culminates at 136 meters, and its bell weighs 20 tons. Its roof is made of varnished tiles that, on the eastern part, depict the emblem of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The cathedral was first bombarded in 1575 by the Ottomans, and then Napoleon, and also during World War II, when it was severely damaged. Restored afterwards, it was visited by Pope Benedict XVI in 2007. Inside the immense nave that was enlarged in the Gothic style under the Habsburgs in the 14th century, leads us to the choir. This is where the composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart married Constance Weber in 1782. St. Stephen's Cathedral houses many artistic treasures that ornament the numerous altars and side chapels. One of the famous people buried here is Emperor Frederick III, and there are also the viscera of members of the Habsburg dynasty. Certainly the most visited tourist monument in Vienna the cathedral still attracts many believers. The pulpit is a true late Gothic masterpiece. The handrail is decorated with stone sculptures of frogs. Standing there as a stylish flower, it is ornamented with the portraits of the four fathers of the church. Among the numerous chapels surrounding the nave, the women's choir houses a sumptuous Gothic altarpiece from the 15th century, depicting scenes from Virgin Mary's life. On the square across from the cathedral, the Haas House was built in the 1990s. Some have said that its very modern style disrupts the beauty of the Gothic cathedral, whose spire is reflected in the windows of the building. In any case, this marriage of the ancient and the modern won't leave you indifferent. In the Butcher's District, the Holy Trinity Orthodox Church proudly displays its Byzantine revival style and its gilding. Towards the end of the 17th century, this neighborhood was frequented by Greek, Turkish, and Syrian merchants. They were all Christian, and the church was built for them around 1860, financed by a banker who was originally from Greece. The interior has a sole nave and a rectangular choir with allusions to Baroque architecture. It was designed by an Austrian architect 
who adapted the Baroque to the neoclassical style of the time. As for the imagery, Karl Rahl and Ludwig Thiersch created the icons and frescoes that cover the walls. The Greek church is now the rallying point for the entire Orthodox community for the Austrian capital. Schön Lantengasse, or beautiful Lantern Alley, winds its way through Vienna's central district. The medieval homes have disappeared, of course, but the Baroque period reconstructions have been very well restored. The street ends at a small square where the Jesuit church is located, with its two towers and early Baroque style. The church was built in 1703 on the site of an older chapel, at a time when the Jesuits' private teachings on philosophy and theology were spreading through the intellectual spheres of Austria. The church was originally dedicated to the founder of the order, Saint Ignatius of Loyola. At a time when the Protestants were gaining power in Europe, the Jesuits and the Counter-Reformation put all of their weight into helping the traditional Catholic Church resist this mystical Protestant revolution. The interior is richly decorated. False trompe marble, golden cherubs, exuberant frescoes, scrolls and cupolas are all displayed in the glory of the triumphant Catholicism of the Counter-Reformation. Still in the city's first district, the Franciscan Square is ornamented with a statue of Moses holding the stick that he used to draw water from the stone. The square is frequented by artists and there are several small bars and restaurants where it's nice to have a drink. An entire side of the square is occupied by the Franciscan Church, completed in 1607. It's the only Renaissance-style religious building in Vienna still decorated with Gothic elements. The church, which belongs to the Franciscan order, has abundant Baroque-style decorations. The high altar was created in 1707 by Andrea Pozzo. The front part of it displays a complex architecture with sculptures and columns. The lights of the side chapels compete with each other, filtered through works that are imprinted with mysticism. Situated on the Arabian Sea, the former Portuguese colony has 101 kilometers of magnificent fine sand beaches. Here, fishing supports over 40,000 people on boats and in canning factories. In Goa, the climate is tropical. It's hot all year round. The most agreeable months are December and January, with temperatures between 20 and 30 degrees on the coast. Tourism is the primary source of revenue for the tiny state. Travelers from around the world come to bask in the sun on the beaches or party beneath the moon at night. The Indians go there to escape the heat of the cities in the summer. Old Goa, the former capital, is now a ghost town that was abandoned in the 18th century because of its insalubrity due to malaria.
Today, no more houses remain, only the sacred is left, and the few churches that are still standing are striking in their size. The Basilica of Bomb Jesus is a Baroque church built in 1605. Its model was the Church of the Jesu in Rome, built ten years earlier by the Jesuits. The building is devoted to the worship of one of the founders of the Society of Jesus, St. Francis Xavier, who took a vow of chastity and poverty, which was unusual at the time. Contrary to popular belief, the church was not originally built to house the body of the priest. His sarcophagus was only transferred here in 1624, after the saint was canonized. The church then quickly became a site of pilgrimage, sheltering the monument with a shrine containing the body of the saint. The cloister is very well preserved. Here, in meditation, the priests walked around the small garden. The Church of St. Francis of Assisi, built in 1521, has a Tuscan-style exterior. It was founded by eight Franciscans who left for Goa in 1517, seven years after the beginning of Portugal's colonial occupation. They built their church on the ruins of a destroyed mosque. The interior of the church includes a large central nave, without side aisles. The pulpit is richly sculpted with floral patterns. The main altar is Baroque, with Corinthian-style elements, and the wall and ceiling are covered in frescoes. Today, the church is no longer active and has been turned into a museum. In order to evangelize, the different religious orders built a lot of monumental structures, which earned Old Goa the title, the Rome or Lisbon of the Orient in the 16th century. The St. Catherine Cathedral is dedicated to St. Catherine of Alexandria. Built in 1534, it is one of the largest churches in Asia. This remaining bell tower contains the Bell of the Inquisition, so called because it rang to begin the auto de fes, ceremonies during which the victims of the Inquisition were paraded in procession through the city, and some of them were burned at the stake. This vast Portuguese Baroque style church measures 76 meters long by 55 meters wide. The high altar is topped by a golden altarpiece occupying the entire rear wall. The baptismal fonts are very old. And one of the six chapels of the transepts is dedicated to Jesus. The St. Cayetan Church has attractive surroundings. Carob trees mark the entry to the Parvis. Built in the 17th century on the model of St. Peter's in Rome, it is topped by a circular dome crowned with a lantern. The church was dedicated to St. Caetan, an Italian priest whose precepts are teach, care for the sick, and encourage confession. Covered with lime, its luminous facade is Corinthian style with a tower on each side. The interior, Baroque, has a beautiful wooden altarpiece dedicated to Our Lady of Divine Providence. It is framed by six carved gilded altars, supported by twisted pillars. Italian-style paintings adorn it. The Rococo-style pulpit is one of the jewels of Goan expertise. It's the Viceroy Francisco de Gama who ordered the construction in 1597 of this ancient port of Old Goa, which opens directly onto the river Mandovi. The Viceroys, who arrived from distant Portugal by boat, passed through here. 
and this is where they receive the keys to the city in order to assume their duties for a term of five years in general. At the crossing of two rivers, the Mandovi to the north and the Zuari to the south, this estuary is full of islands, the largest of which is the first Portuguese Goa. Today, you travel around by ferry. The richness of its historical, human, and mystical heritage is truly a revelation. With its capacity to generate exaltation or shivers of joy, this region of the world shows itself to be exceptionally rich in experiences for its visitors. In the back country lies Ouro Preto. This city was founded in 1711 following the discovery of gold in the rivers of the state of Minas Gerais. Crowds of gold diggers soon joined by shop owners, then settled here to strike it rich. Ouro Preto quickly became both a prosperous city and a big city. Around 1750, it had a bigger population than Rio de Janeiro, New York. Tiradentes Square is the central point from which all roads diverge. It is surrounded by imposing public and private monuments built in colonial Brazilian style. In the back of the square stands the former regional parliament dating from 1784. It perfectly reflects the economic power of the city in the 18th century. Opposite the square stands the governor's palace. Today it shelters the mine school, Escola de Minas, and a museum on the same theme. In the city, a multitude of Baroque churches subsist and bear testimony to its former prosperity. Among them, Our Lady of Carmel was built between 1766 and 1772, following the plans of Manuel Francisco Lisboa. It displays an artistic shape that is considered as truly national. His son, Antonio Francisco Lisboa, built the Church of St. Francis of Assisi. It is the most famous church in the city of Ouro Preto and one of the most beautiful examples of mining Baroque style. Nicknamed Al Radinho, the little cripple, because he suffered from leprosy, he was the greatest artist and sculptor of colonial Brazil. Though the architecture and sculptures are inspired by models introduced by the Portuguese colonists, the works differ considerably from these models by their decorative elements, especially the stone sculptures on the facades. This culture of sculpted stone has been preserved in the city, and the local market offers visitors many sculpted stone objects in varying degrees of good taste. All of the city's buildings are in a good state and have been well preserved. But some houses and churches suffer from a certain negligence, like this church, which was also built in the 18th century by Alaradinho's father. In fact, he's buried here with his son. The historic city of Ouro Preto has preserved its urban center built during the colonial period. The variety of its civilian buildings, marked by the elegance of their aesthetic and architectural qualities, gives the city exceptional universal value.
the Casa dos Contos, which was built in 1745 by Juan Dominguez da Vega, is the most famous and certainly one of the most refined houses of the city. The metal extracted from the surrounding mines was weighed and melted here. Along the original winding main road, whose irregular design blends into the contours of the landscape, stand squares, public buildings, houses, fountains, bridges and churches, who all together form an exceptional homogenous ensemble of Baroque architecture. Assuredly, the oldest church of Uro Preto, Our Lady of Pillar, is among the religious edifices designed by Araradinho. Completed in 1731 on the vestiges of the original church, the somewhat austere facade of Our Lady of the Pillar is surprising. Not far from here stands a house that was inhabited by the priests of Our Lady of the Pillar. Today, it is a center that is self-directed by civil engineering students from the Mind School. When gold digging ended in the state of Minas Gerais, little by little, the city became abandoned. It has changed very little since this time. The city has remained a cobblestone colonial city, listed a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. Furthermore, the city stands on many hills with relatively steep slopes, from which one can enjoy many different views. This gives the city a special charm. Located only 14 kilometers from Uro Preto, Mariana is the oldest city in the state and its former capital. It was founded on July 16, 1696, and is today a touristic city with numerous Baroque buildings. The small city square is magnificently shaded and contains the most beautiful fountain in the region. Strolling through the picturesque streets, one can admire the wooden and soapstone houses, which also display very beautiful ironwork balconies. Say Cathedral, or Our Lady of the Assumption, is the oldest church in the city. It was built in 1711. Its sober, symmetrical facade evokes the austerity of the early conquest, and it gives out onto a square where the unrelenting sun reigns. Located on the Moskva River, Moscow is the capital of the Russian Federation. This historic city combines the ancient and the modern, the Red Square, the Kremlin, the domes of St. Basil's Cathedral, Lenin's tomb, the Bolshoi, the KGB Museum, and other symbols of an exciting and tumultuous past abound in all the districts of the city. The architectural pearl of Moscow has always been and still remains the Kremlin. It is a fortified complex built at the end of the 15th century with the expertise of Italian and Russian architects. It is surrounded by a great wall that protects its cathedrals and palaces. The Grand Palace was built between 1837 and 1851. After having been the official residence of the Tsars and then the directors of the USSR, it is now the official residence and workplace of the President of the Russian Federation. The wall is pierced by powerful entry towers, like the Troitskaya Tower here, which once had a clock. Like all fortresses, the Kremlin had an armory, the arsenal which now houses the regiment responsible for the Russian President's security.
The remains are exhibited like these Russian cannons mounted on 16th and 17th century carriages. Or the 875 cannons taken from the enemy during the retreat of Napoleon's Grande Armée in 1812. There is also the Tsar Pushka, literally the king of the cannons. It's a gigantic cannon cast in 1586 by the order of Tsar Fyodor I, son of Ivan the Terrible. It weighs 39 tons and has a caliber of 890 millimeters. Continuing with this monumentality, the Tsar Kolokol is a master bell made of bronze that weighs 202 tons. The broken piece that came off when it fell is over 11 tons. It was cast in 1735 by a team of 200 men by order of Anna I to realize the dream of her grandfather Alexis I. Amongst the Kremlin's cathedrals, the bell tower complex of Ivan III the Great includes a bell tower, the church bell of the Nativity, and the Filarete bell tower. The structure was built during the 16th and 17th centuries and is located at the entrance of Cathedral Square, where the Cathedral of the Dormition is found. It was the first stone church in Moscow and is the oldest, largest and most important in the Kremlin. On its steps, Ivan III, the Great, tore up the treaty that submitted Moscow to Mongol rule and thus declared the independence of Russia in the beginning of the 16th century. This church also marks Moscow's ascension to the status of the seat of the Russian Orthodox Church. On the inside, the iconostasis and the paintings that decorate the walls are particularly remarkable from the 17th century for the most part. A Venetian Renaissance appearance strongly marks the exterior of the Cathedral of the Archangel Michael, even if the golden bulbs remind us that we're in Russia. Built in the beginning of the 16th century, its central door is topped by a circular pediment covered entirely by paintings. The victories of the Russian army were celebrated within its walls, where there is a 13-meter-high wooden iconostasis. There only remain a few fragments of the original paintings from the time of Ivan the Terrible. Indeed, it was repainted in the middle of the 17th century by 92 great Russian masters, in the style of the stone walls of the Renaissance. The church also serves as an acropolis for the Grand Princes of Moscow and the first Tsars, who thus rest under the protection of St. Michael. To go to Red Square now, you have to pass through the gates of the Resurrection, The first gate was built in 1535, but demolished under Stalin's rule to facilitate access to the square for military vehicles during parades. The first building that jumps out in the back of the square is the Cathedral of Basil the Blessed. The cathedral, built in 1555, is now the symbol of traditional Russian architecture. Tsar Ivan IV, known as the Terrible, ordered its construction to celebrate the annexing of Tatarstan by the Russian troops. The construction lasted 125 years and the building has known many changes. The stairs were covered, the landings topped with pointed roofs and the bulbs decorated with protruding patterns. The building is ornamented by nine main cupolas, each different from the others in its own shape, decorations, and colors. The cathedral is in fact made of nine separate churches, each one ornamented with a tower. The name Basil the Blessed comes from a figure who practiced a form of very provocative spirituality. He spent all his life naked and lived off charity. After his death, he was buried next to the church, and in 1588, a chapel was built on his tomb, where all those who sought the protection of the deceased came to pray. With time, his glory and holiness eclipsed the memory of the annexation of Tatarstan, and the church was consequently referred to more and more as Basil the Blessed. 
Later, Tsar Theodore I placed a pure silver shrine covered with gold and silk above the relics of the saint's body, which was plundered by the Polish. The restorations carried out were very successful. Back to the Red Square. Along the wall, the Spaskaya Tower was once the ceremonial entrance of the Kremlin. To its right, there is Lenin's tomb, made of red granite. It was finished in 1930, and within it lies Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, the famous revolutionary and Soviet politician who died in 1924. Next to it, a small cemetery is reserved for other communist leaders. Since 1961, the body of the famous dictator Joseph Stalin has been buried there, in the shadow of the wall. You can see that Moscow is really a town that is marked and shaped by art, painting, architecture and historical movements mixed together in order to give visitors great surges of emotions. Suzhou is one of the oldest cities in China and now has more than two million inhabitants. From the 13th century, Suzhou was known as the capital of silk, of which it was the industrial center with its famous embroidery school. While the city has modernized, it has nonetheless retained an authentic character in its historic district, with its small streets bordered by traditional style homes and its small stalls and shops of all kinds. Built on the edge of a lake in the mouth of a river, the city has many canals, which have earned it the name, the Venice of the East. The two cities are also sister cities. Marco Polo said that Suzhou had more than 6,000 bridges to span them. That was certainly an exaggeration. These days, the city has around 160, and that many again in the outskirts. Visiting them is a joy, because they have no cars, no shops, just small boats that are used to get around or for romantic promenades. Two thousand five hundred years ago, moats circled the city, and there was even, as you see here, gates for boats that were topped with defensive pagodas, which are now demilitarized. The gate is now part of Panmen Park, in which there is also the Rigang Pagoda, literally the pagoda of auspicious light. The pagoda as you see it today dates from the year 1125, and replaced an older one from the third century. It's an octagonal building that is 43 meters high, built with both bricks and wood. Recently, statues, ancient books, and highly valuable jewels were found in a hiding space on the fourth floor of the building. The city of Suzhou has numerous famous gardens, nine of which are on the UNESCO list of World Cultural Heritage Sites because they are particularly representative of classical Chinese gardens. Their names are full of imagery, like the Garden of Simple Policy, the Couple's Retreat Garden, the Retreat and Reflection Garden, the Garden of Harmony, the Master of the Nets Garden. Or like this one here, the Humble Administrator's Garden, This garden was created in 1509 during the Ming Dynasty. 
It was originally the private garden of a retired civil servant from the Chinese government. When you walk in the garden, the dominant scents are lotus and pine, and you can see magnificent rhododendrons and beds of cyclamen. The water occupies two-thirds of the surface area of this beautiful garden dotted with lovely pavilions. The western part is very popular with the public because it has a covered gallery that represents a dragon and the tiles are its scales. Each body of water is green as it is linked to jade and has its own ambience and its own flora and fauna. The Lion Grove Garden covers a surface area of one hectare and is renowned for its artificial rocks. It is considered to be the most amusing of Suzhou's nine classical gardens because in its center there's a small pond with a zigzag bridge going across it. This garden is a complex maze in which visitors like to come to lose themselves. Several buildings with traditional architecture are scattered around and are worth a look, especially the pavilion left by Emperor Qianlong of the Qing Dynasty, where painters and poets once came to seek inspiration. In China, Emperor Qianlong is considered to have been one of the greatest emperors of the last five centuries. It is said that he came to this garden to re-energize himself and to get away from the tumult of the imperial court. Incidentally, he himself wrote the calligraphic inscription that is featured in the pavilion he liked the most. Here as well, the buildings of the park have very poetic names, like Standing in the Snow Hall, the Pavilion of Greetings, and the Plum Blossom Pavilion. Their furniture is characteristic of the richness of the Qing Dynasty in the 18th century. But the maze remains the most attractive feature of the site. It has several levels and includes numerous lion-shaped rocks quick to excite the imagination. Chinese gardens are both spaces for living and entertainment in which you can wander, and magical sites, miniature cosmos, in which you can seek to recreate an ideal image of nature. Therefore, they represent a constant compromise between the aesthetic and symbolic dimensions. Florence is one of the most beautiful cities in Italy and is the capital of Tuscany, one of the most beautiful regions of the country. Its name is closely tied to that of the Medici. The omnipresence of this rich Tuscan family that reigned supreme throughout the entire Renaissance enabled a clear evolution of the city on the economic, political, and of course, cultural levels. In this regard, the city had no shortage of important personalities in this key period in the history of art. The Piazza della Signoria, or Signoria Square, is the most important touristic square in the city, along with the Piazza del Duomo. In Renaissance style, it expanded between the 12th and 14th centuries into its current L-shape. The square represents the historical political heart of Florence with the Palazzo Vecchio, before which stands the equestrian statue of Cosimo I of Tuscany. 
Born on June 12, 1519 in Florence, he was the Duke of Florence and later the first Grand Duke of Tuscany until his death during the last years of the Renaissance. He transformed the financial power of the Medici family into political power and was also the major financier of the artistic transformation of Florence. He restored the Medici dynasty into a quasi-monarchy that lasted until the 18th century. His great bronze equestrian statue, commissioned by his son, was executed by the sculptor Giambologna in 1598. Just like Florence, the Piazza della Signoria exhibits its richness with several beautiful statues that give a glimpse of the treasures of the Renaissance, such as the David created by Michelangelo between 1501 and 1504. It measures 4.34 meters high and was carved from a single block of white marble. Another statue shows Hercules killing the monster Cacus. The sculptor Bandinelli sought to compete with the art of Michelangelo, but did not show the same genius in the art of the movement. Another great master, Donatello, created his sculpture in bronze around 1460. In a scene from the Old Testament, you see Judith killing Holofernes after having seduced him. The Mazzocco is a symbol of the power of the Florentines as well as that of the Medici. It was also created by Donatello in 1420. The red lily is the emblem of the city. In the square, there is, of course, a fountain. It shows Neptune with the features of Cosimo I and makes reference to the maritime power of Florence. It was made by Bartolomeo Amanati in 1565 for the marriage of Francesco I de Medici, the son of Cosimo I. In it, you can clearly see the influence of the mannerism of the late Renaissance with the river gods, the dancing satyrs. It forms a harmonious whole and stood as an example for subsequent decorative works. One distinctive feature of the square is the Loggia dei Lanzi. Built at the end of the 14th century, it was intended for the ceremonies and receptions of the Republic of Florence. Today, Renaissance works of art, or their copies, are exhibited there. The Rape of the Sabine Woman is a sculpture by Gian Bologna. Sculpted from a single block of marble, this mannerist work makes a reference to one of the Sabine virgins abducted by the Romans. Perseus decapitating Medusa was commissioned by Cosimo I. The hero Perseus indeed fears no adversary and triumphs over all trials. Antiquity is full of symbols that serve the Medici's cause, like Hercules slaying the centaur here. The group showing Menelaus carrying the body of his friend Patroclus during the episode of the Trojan War is itself a statue from Roman antiquity copied from a Greek original. In contrast, the Rape of Polyxena is a modern statue dating from the 19th century. Polyxena, who caused the death of Achilles, was sacrificed on his tomb. Built in 1255, the Bagello Palace was the headquarters of the city's police and a prison in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, before being turned into a museum in the 19th century. The interior courtyard features beautiful arcades and a monumental staircase leading to the Loggia Verona. Amongst the statues exhibited outside, there is St. Paul's Canon, which is made in 1625 by Cosimo Cenni for Ferdinand II of Tuscany. 
It bears the name St. Paul because the name evokes the booming voice of the Apostle, whose head is represented in the round on the breech of the cannon. A beautiful Mannerist fountain opens the way to the treasures exhibited here. The main interest is in its various rooms that present Tuscan works of the 16th century, concentrating on Michelangelo and Donatello in particular. His David is a bronze sculpture created between 1430 and 1432 and is considered the first great bronze to be made since antiquity. It was financed by Cosimo I for his palace. Among the masterpieces on display are those of the ceramicist Andrea della Robbia, easily recognizable with their blue and white tones of a rare elegance. Several works by Michelangelo are exhibited, including the famous relief portraying a Madonna with child. For lovers of sculpture, the Bagello Museum in Florence is truly a must-see a beautiful museum that is not to be missed. You can see that in the 15th century, Florence was able to escape artistically from the Gothic style and join with the movement of liberty called the Renaissance. <laughs>